Shamit is related to a particular biblical character. That's probably largely under Kabbalistic influence, but not only Kabbalistic influence. The last Hakafa is King David's Hakafa. Uh, at the Malava Malka, the um, Kabbalists again spoke about the Malava Malka, the Saturday night meal, the special meal after Shabbat. Dohi Sudata de David Malka Meshicha. This is, this, this is the meal of King David, the messianic meal of King David. So David looms large in a variety of contexts in our tradition. And I would say by contrast, it's very interesting that Shlomo, by contrast, compared to David, plays a very minor role. There's very little about Shlomo. <laughs> now we will, in the course of these sessions, look at some of the rabbinic statements about Shlomo where he does figure, <coughs> and, and he does actually <coughs> figure to some extent, but it's a, a much to much smaller degree. I just wanted to begin by making that point. Now, I thought that today the best thing would be to look at, or to, to begin to look at the character of Shlomo and the place of Shlomo as it appears in the, uh, in the Bible. And then we'll move ultimately to uh, Shlomo's, the understanding of different biblical, different, different rabbinic texts, how they see uh, Shlomo. So let me begin by saying that Shlomo actually, when you think about the Bible, is a very important character. Uh, one might say he even exceeds David because whereas the book of Psalms is ascribed to David, some of them explicitly is ascribed to David, but David has one book and King Solomon has three. The book of Shira Shirim Hashem with Shlomo, the Song of Songs, which plays a very central role in terms of Jewish liturgy and Jewish thought, that's ascribed to Solomon. The book of Proverbs, the long book of Proverbs is ascribed largely to Solomon. And even the parts of the book that are ascribed to somebody else, by the way, and we'll see this in the rabbinic mind, it's also Solomon. Solomon has seven names. Um, so that's the book of Mishle, the book of Proverbs. And of course, the third book of the Bible, Kohelet, Divrei Kohelet ben David, Melech Yerushalayim. The book of Kohelet never says Shlomo's name, but it mentions in the beginning of the book and the end of the book, this character, the king, king of Jerusalem, the son of David, and um, his name is Kohelet. That's the beginning of Ecclesiastes or Kohelet. At the end of Kohelet, Biyoter Shaya Kohelet Chacham, Oli Madat et Ha'am Izein Bechiker, Tikein Mishalim Harbe. It talks about this Kohelet as one who has, is a teacher uh, who studied and who had many proverbs. And we know that. Shlomo, in the book of Kings, we are told that Shlomo had many Mishalim and many songs. So the book of Kings has Shlomo as an author of Proverbs and the author of many songs or poems. And that fits very nicely into the uh, descriptions of both Kohelet and Mishle, <coughs> which we would describe as, I say, wisdom literature. That fits very well into the proverb piece. And of course, he wrote many poems, songs or poems, Shirim, the great song, uh, surely one of the great songs in that tradition is Shir HaShirim, the Song of Songs. All three are ascribed to Shlomo. So Shlomo does play a central role in terms of uh, the Bible, apart from the fact that he is a central figure in two biblical books. One of them is the Book of Kings, Sefer Mulachim, which is divided into Malachim Aleph and Malachim Bet. Uh, so Malachim Aleph, the beginning of the book, whether this division is a fair division or not, but the first 11 chapters of Kings, uh, Shlomo is overall the major figure. <laughs> so he's a major biblical figure there. <laughs> and secondly, in the book of Chronicles in Divrei Hayamim, the book of Chronicles has two major figures. The first is David, and David dies at the end of first first book of Chronicles, Divrei Hayamim Aleph, and Divrei Hayamim Bet, 
the first nine chapters of Chronicles, of Second Chronicles, is all about King Solomon. And in point of fact, King Solomon or Solomon figures in the last two chapters of First Chronicles. This evening, that's what I want to speak about, the Solomon of Kings and the Solomon of Chronicles. But it's fair to say that Shlomo, when it comes to the Tanakh, plays a major role. One could make the argument outside of Moses, he is the main author of the, of, of the Bible. He has three books ascribed to him and he's a major character in two other books. So he's obviously a very central figure. It is interesting to note, by the way, and we'll come to this later over the course of these seven sessions, that when it comes to the three books that are ascribed to Shlomo, namely the Song of Songs, Shira Shirim, and Proverbs, and Kohelet, that all three of them, three for three, the Talmud raises a question as to whether they should be included amongst the holy writings. And we'll get to that. But the Mishnah and Mesechet Yadayim, in the third chapter, raises the question specifically about two of the books, Kohelet on one hand and Shira Shirim on the other, and the dispute, or at least the question is raised, whether these books should be part of the canon at all. So there is a question about Shira Shirim and a question about Kohelet. And the Gemara elsewhere, and we'll get to this as well as we proceed through these weeks, raises the question about the book of Proverbs also. So he's three for three in the sense that this person to whom the, the rabbis have ascribed uh, three books, but all three of them, the rabbinic tradition raises questions whether we should include them all together. And that I think is very interesting. And I think is typical or, or perhaps re emblematic of Shlomo in general, of the rabbinic attitude towards Shlomo, which on one hand, he's the man who builds the temple and his prayer upon the building of the temple is, is very important, very beautiful and very important. Um, there is peace in his time. On the other hand, the rabbinic tradition sees uh, many problems in terms of Shlomo and Shlomo's character. And in point of fact, he is David's son who one might say builds the temple and the kingship is fully established through Shlomo. And on the other hand, the seeds of the dissolution of the kingship are, are found, are to be found in Shlomo's kingship. And right after his death, the monarchy is, uh, is divided into two. The nation splits into two, the northern and the southern kingdom. So all of this factors into the rabbinic thinking about Shlomo, but how they take it, where they take it, uh, that's extraordinarily interesting. I called this set of sessions, which I've never taught before, Solomon and King Solomon and his, and his demons. And the reason I chose that name for the course is because one of the texts we're going to look at, which is very famous, is about Solomon and the, uh, and the, and the king of the demons, Ashmodai, and Solomon's interaction with the king of the demons, which is a, found in the Medrash, but also found in the Bavli, in a long and rather famous story about King Solomon, which I wanted to take at least one week, if not two, to study very carefully together with you. That's by way of introduction. Let me say a few words now about the Solomon of Kings and the Solomon of Chronicles, and I'll stop periodically and take comments or questions. So when, when one reads the Bible, just reads what it says, and I think anybody who reads the Bible, uh, and we take what it says at face value, we want to understand it, what it actually says, it is clear that the Solomon of the Book of Kings and the Solomon of the book of Chronicles, that is to say the description of the two Solomons could not be more different in so many ways. Let me give a couple of very simple examples. Uh, let's take, for example, the book of Kings. You all have with you, if you all have your own Tanakh, so the, uh, the, the safari should be uh, up there for you to see. And if you look at the first two chapters of Kings, the first two chapters of Kings, actually, are fundamentally a continuation of the Book of Shmuel. In fact, the, most of the moderns believe that the Book of Shmuel actually should end, at the, should end at the end of chapter two of Kings. 
I'm not, not going to get into that question right now, but it's clear that the book of Kings, the first two chapters, which are about the establishing of David's kingship through, through succession. David is a king, but you only have kingship you, if you have a, a successor. So the book of Shmuel is about kingship. And for the kingship to exist, you need succession. Saul was the first king, of course, but he really never established the kingship. The man who might have become king, namely Jonathan, hero of the book of Shmuel, he uh, abdicates. He's not interested in the kingship for himself. He supports David. The one who replaces Saul after Saul's death, Ishbosheth, is a person of no real, uh, no real strength. He was put in there by the general Abner, and he's uh, very weak and in ineffective. He's not really a king. And David, of course, is the second king of Israel. And the question is, can David establish his kingship through his successor? Now, the first two chapters of the Book of Kings talk about the question of succession. The book begins, and we're not, we don't have time to get into this in any detail, but the book begins with Hamelch David Zaken Baba Yamim. As you see, David was old, advanced in years. So they covered him with clothes. He could not be warm. And the idea of, of the clothing is interesting. The clothing, of course, in the book of Samuel is the symbol of kingship. Saul's coat is torn. That's a sign that he will lose the kingship. So the point is the book of Kings begins by telling us David is old and we don't know who his successor will be. He doesn't have an obvious successor. He's very old. And by Yomuo Avadav, his servants say, let's search out for this uh, king, my lord the king, a young woman who will stand before the king and be his attendant and lie in the king's bosom and warm the king up, kind of electric blanket, human being electric blanket. And they look for a beautiful, most beautiful woman. And they find in the third verse, if you scroll down, Abishag Ashunami, they found in verse number three, Avishag the Shunami, bring it to David, the king, she warms the king up. The king, here they translate, was not intimate with her, literally did not know her. And here it's very interesting. Sometimes the verb to know has a sexual meaning. Sometimes it means to know. In this particular case, it may have a sexual meaning, but it also may have the other meaning. Because it's not really clear in this chapter how much the king knows and doesn't know. We, the reader, don't know what David knows and doesn't know. Here's what we do know, that David is old and there is no clear successor to David. David has not named a successor. Now, when I taught the book of Shmuel, which I've done several times, I argued for the position that the real, the one who should have succeeded David, the one who was fit to be king initially, and is really in David's image. All kinds of good things to say about him before he turns the other way was actually his son Absalom, Absalom, who actually initially is a kind of hero. He protects his sister Tamar. He acts with a lot of tact. He can be ruthless. He does kill his brother, Amnon. But if anybody deserved it, it's Amnon. And he waits to do it. So in fact, the death of Absalom is a terrible tragedy, not just for David, who mourns Av Shalom uncontrollably, but I argued is a tragedy for the kingship. Because the man who might have been king, I argue who should have been king, is not going to be the king. And now at the end of the book of Shmuel, there is nobody who has been chosen king. David is old, and there is no successor named. And what this chapter is about is that one of David's sons, namely Adonia, Adonia ben Chagit, has declared himself king. He declares himself king. He goes around, he hires the chariots and horses with escorts, and he's declaring himself king. And in this chapter, and he has support from certain members of David's entourage, from David's chief general, Yoav, from one of David's two priests, Eviatar, and others. But some don't support him. 
in verse number eight, Tzadok and others don't support it. And the point of chapter one is that in this setting where there is no named king, David names no one as king, that the prophet Nathan, Natan Anavi, he is the one who had condemned David after the Bathsheba incident. He goes to Bathsheba. And later on in the chapter, a few verses down, if you scroll down a few verses, you'll see that he goes to Bathsheba and says that the King David, um, Adonia has declared himself king. He says, take my advice, he says, save your own life, he says to Bathsheba, save the life of your son, Solomon, go to the king. And Natan, the prophet Nathan, has a plan, a plan that will uh, enable Bathsheba and Solomon to survive, but more than survive, he wants Solomon to be the next king. Now, what's interesting is, and that's what this chapter is about. It's about Nathan's plan, which actually does work at the end, because at the end of the day, David says, Shlomo shall be king, and not just shall be king, but in my very lifetime, he uh, appoints uh, Shlomo as king. He has a public coronation of Shlomo, and Shlomo becomes the king. Now, what's interesting is that in the version that we have here in the Book of Kings, all of this is completely and totally absent from Chronicles. The entire story doesn't appear in the Book of Chronicles at all. Quite the opposite, as we'll see. But in the story, Nathan says to Bathsheba, you have to go to the king um, and say to him on the top of, you see on, the, on this verse on top, my Lord, you yourself swore to your maidservant, go and tell David that he took an oath saying to me, to Bathsheba, your son Shlomo shall, shall succeed me as king. Shlomo b'nechim lo chacharai, hu yesheva kisi. Go, go remind the king or tell the king about the oath that he made, that he swore that Shlomo will be the king. And you know, king, she says, Adonia is making himself the king, made a big meal, he's proclaiming himself king, he invites many people, didn't invite Solomon. And then Nathan says, and when you're talking to the king, I will come after you, and then continuing verses, and I will be late yet to Varayach. I'll fill in the blanks, or perhaps it means I will confirm what you're saying. So that's the plan. The plan is a two-pronged attack on the king. One is to remind him, she's going to remind him of the oath he took to her. And then Nathan will come in and say something additional. Now Nathan says to the Bathsheba, Adonia has made himself king, but our, but our Lord, the King David, does not know. Fine, That's, so this is the story. Now, the first point I wanted to make is that we read the first chapter of Kings, David is old, could die at any moment. There is no implication whatsoever in terms of what we have read prior to chapter one, that David took any such oath. And there's no implication from any text that we can tell that David has conferred or intends to confer the kingship upon Shlomo. In fact, when you read the story, you have to wonder whether David ever took an oath altogether. She is so-called reminding this old man of an oath which he maybe did take and if he did take it, had no intention apparently of fulfilling it, or he never took it in the first place, and this old feeble, and perhaps not fully, uh, fully uh, cognizant, cognizant of what's going on, is being reminded of, of an oath that perhaps he never took. In short, the story here in chapter one, in which David will actually say at the end, oh yes, I'm gonna keep the oath that I once made, whether he made the oath or not, but he swears that Shlomo will be the king. And that's what happens in the chapter. In chapter one, Solomon is made king, but he's made king through a, a ruse, one might say, the two of them coming in together and persuading the king or informing the king about what Adonia is doing. In fact, when Nathan goes to the king, he walks into the king. If you read more, Nathan said, you must have said, Adonia shall succeed me as king and sit upon my throne. And he goes on and says, you know, he's made this big meal. He didn't invite me. He says, and then he says to David a little further down, 
How come you didn't tell me? I'm surprised you didn't tell me. If the decision came from you, he says, why didn't you inform me? Even though Nathan said earlier, my Lord, the King does not know. So there's something about the entire story, which is very interesting. And that is, we're talking about the court of the King. In the court of the King, nobody tells the truth, even the prophet. Prophet says, why didn't you tell me? If, if you know, but earlier he said the king doesn't know. So what is it? Does the king know or not know? So everybody is manipulating here. The people in the court are figuring out what might the king want to keep him warm. Let's get him a beautiful woman to warm him up. The king didn't ask for it. The prophet is misrepresenting the truth for, for a good end, but it's not a place. The court is not a place where you can actually simply tell the truth. The, the one who read it this way, by the way, interesting enough, whoever this person may be, is the one who wrote a little book we're all familiar with called Megillat Esther, which of course is, plays right off the story, searching for the beautiful woman to make the king happy, to warm the king up. That's the beginning of the book of Esther, which of course is directly related to what's going on over here. But for our purposes, here's the point, there is no sense at all in this chapter that the king actually, we certainly can't prove, that the king wanted Shlomo to be his choice. And in fact, he clearly was not the first choice. There's Absalom, there is Amnon, who's the oldest, there's Adonia, the next oldest, and then there's Solomon, who at the end of the day becomes the king. Now this is what's presented here in the very beginning of the book of Kings. Now let's look for a moment, what we have in chapter 28 of the book of Chronicles. A, I would say slightly, what might say, a little bit opposite story in, the, in the, the way the book of Chronicles tells us. Before we get to the book of Chronicles, does anybody have any comments or questions about the Solomon who appears in the beginning of the book of Kings? Anybody speak up now or you can- I, I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, please. Um, is Shlomo the youngest son, I mean, of David? Is he the absolute youngest? I don't know. He's certainly on the younger side. He's nowhere, the, the, the first four sons of David were mentioned earlier in Shmuel. Right. Uh, the oldest is Amnon. He's the one that rapes his sister. The second son is very interesting, is the son of Abigail, who never figures in any stories. His name is Kilov in the book of Samuel. In the book of Chronicles, he's called Daniel. He figures not at all in the stories at all. Uh, I've spoken in the past about why that is so, but leave that out. Son number three is Absol. Right. Son number four is Adonia. Those are the oldest sons and they're born earlier. Solomon is born much later. So Solomon is, if not the youngest, he's on the younger side. And he's obviously a young person in the story. Mm -hmm. So that you're right, that could be one of the reasons that David doesn't think of him because he's too young. That is certainly possible. But yeah. my point is de facto, he doesn't figure. And if not, one gets the impression, if not for the intervention of Nathan and Bathsheba, for their own reasons, uh, Solomon never becomes the king. It's not that David, had David wanted Solomon, David might have appointed Solomon earlier. He doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. at least not in the version that we have in the book of Kings. Now in Chronicles is a radically different story. Right. Night and day is different. So we don't have any hints at all that he could be the favored son, just like Joseph was the favorite. There is one hint. There is one hint, okay? I'll tell you the one hint that we do have. And that is at the end of the David and Bathsheba story. At the end of the David and Bathsheba story, as we recall, which is chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel, so in that story, after the Bathsheba incident, she's pregnant mm -hmm. and um, she gives birth to a child and David has her husband killed and he marries Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan goes to David to condemn him. And the prophet Nathan says to David, this child that Bathsheba is, is, is born for you is gonna die. And David prays for the child, the child dies. And then it says he consoles Bathsheba 
and she gets pregnant and she has another child. And David sends a message to Nathan the prophet. And he, he names him Yedidya, the beloved of God on account of God. So there, I believe there, there I think maybe even the name Solomon is also mentioned. Let me find that for a moment in my Tanakh. That'll be in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. End of chapter 12. Let's see where that is. Um, yeah, Shlomo. It's that chapter 12, 2 Samuel, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> so there you have a hint. Because his name is Solomon. His name is also Yedidya. Jedidiah, Yedidya means the beloved of God. And it's interesting that the name Yedidya, the beloved of God, is synonymous with another name, namely David, David, the beloved one. So Yedidya, one might say, there's a hint that Solomon slash Yedidya, who's named by Nathan, it sounds like or he brings, either Nathan names him himself or, or brings God's word, so he's not going to die, it means. He's beloved of God. There, there is a hint in chapter 12 that Solomon could be the next king. But what is surprising, not really surprising if you know the book of Samuel, it's, it's, a, it's an ingenious work, that the author simply drops it all together. From that, you never hear about Solomon again. You hear about Amnon, you hear about Absalom, you hear about all kinds of things. We hear nothing about Shlomo at all until we get to our chapter, the first chapter of Kings. So that I think is, that's interesting actually. And there you Rabbi, do have a hint in response to your question. Rabbi, okay, I'll take one more comment. Anybody else? Rabbi, yes. Uh, just to further this point um, that we don't know much about Solomon. It, this could be the first time that we see uh, machinations going on to seize the kingship, which happened many times before this, but never without the actual king being involved at all. He's held at arm's length. We don't even know if he's aware of what's going on. That's an excellent point. That is an excellent point. He is right. I mean, that would speak to perhaps his, his youth, maybe. Whatever the explanation is, but you are, uh, your insight is a good one. The, there is always, as you say, machinations or maneuvering in terms of power. The, the battle of Absalom and Amnon should be read not just as uh, the question about the violation of Absalom's sister by her brother, that's part of it, but we have to remember these are the two main uh, contenders for the, uh, for the, for the kingship. The, the, your larger point, incredibly important point, is that when studying something like the Book of Shmuel, which is about people, personalities, behaviors, we should never lose sight of the fact that it's also about politics. And that's what's interesting. It's about the personal and the political. And those two things are actually connected. The idea that they can com be completely separated from each other is simply not true in the book of Shmuel. And I don't think it's ever true, really. So there's always a connection between the personal and the, and the political. So that's a very important insight in general about the book of Shmuel. And it is striking that here, by contrast, Shlomo's not, at least not at this stage, involved at all. Now, later he gets very involved in the politics. We should not forget that the first thing that Solomon does after he assumes the kingship is to uh, kill his brother. Let's not forget that. A story that, of course, is completely absent in the book of Chronicles. But in the book of Kings, in chapter 2, he kills his brother, who, is, who, who, is, who aspires to the throne. At least Shlomo sees it. He gave him a warning. That was fair, but when he steps out of line, he can be ruthless. He kills other people as well. We'll get to all that. I wanted to, by contrast, look at chapter in, in, the, in, the, in Chronicles, in Divrei Hayamim, okay. to give us a sense of how our Bible can contain within it two cano canonical books, radically different views of Shlomo, and actually radically different stories. It's a completely different story. Um, I'm sorry, Rabbi Silver. Yes. I'm so terribly sorry to interrupt. But Go somewhere ahead. down the line in the next several weeks, could you speak of the idea that Shlomo's Mishle is to, is David's to him? Just just somewhere along the line, you know. We will talk about. Okay. We will okay. talk about. Well, we only have seven weeks. We will talk I about said. Shlomo, who's the author of Mishle. 
right. and Kohelet and Shira Shirim as understood by the rabbis. Right. And we will be, be looking specifically at a Gemara, which talks about Mishle and about Kohelet. Okay. That Gemara Thank doesn't you. mention Shira Shirim. Maybe we'll get to Shira Shirim as well. But And Mishle figures prominently in the Solomon stories. The verses from Mishle are always being quoted. And we'll see some of these stories. They're extraordinarily interesting. And it's a, hopefully there'll be a lot of good discussion around them as well. So we will get there. Okay. Let's take a let's take a thank you for that. Let's take a look at um, the book of Chronicles in that chapter. Okay. Is that chapter 29? I think it is. Let's see. 28. Let's let's start reading this. By Yakhel David at David at this point is old. He, he dies at the end of First Chronicles, which is chapter 29. And this is towards the end of David's life. So he's assembling all of Israel, all the tribal officers, the divisional leaders, etc., captains of the thousands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He brings them to Jerusalem. Let's let's read that. Let's read some more. So David gets up, he stands up, he says, Listen, he says, listen, listen to me. When I was hear me, hear me, my brothers, right? I had intended to build a house for God, a resting place for the Ark of the Covenant, the footstool of our Lord. That was my intention, says David. But God said to me in verse number three, famously, you will not build a house for my name. You're a man of war. You have shed blood. So David says, the reason I couldn't build the house was because I'm a, a warrior. I'm a soldier. I've shed blood and the shedding of blood and the building of the temple seem to be mutually exclusive. That's a very important point. Bear that in mind. So I couldn't do it. And by the way, we never have this statement anywhere in the Bible explicitly that David can't build the temple because he shed blood. God never said that to David as we have it in our text, not in Samuel and not in Chronicles. It's what David says. It's David's reason. So, but so David continues, God chose me over all of my father's house to be king. God chose Judah to be the ruler and my family is from Yehuda. And then he continues and all of my sons and I have many sons, continues. God chose, capital H as he is God. God chose my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. God said to me, Shlomo bin Cha, Solomon your son, hu yivne beiti v'chatserotai, he will build my house and my courts, ki bocharti boli ruben, I have chosen him as a son for me, for God, and I will be his father. I will establish this kingdom forever if he keeps firmly to the observance of my commandments and rules as he does now, so this is explicit that David says, and David's talking to all of Israel. There is no Adonia, there is no Nathan the prophet intervening, there's no Bathsheba. The whole Bathsheba story doesn't appear in Chronicles altogether. It's David speaking to everybody and making it clear. I have many sons. Only one is a candidate. There's one candidate. And then David, after speaking to the entire congregation, now turns his attention to Shlomo. Right? And now you, God, David says, my son Shlomo, Shlomo Bani, know the God of your father, serve God with a single mind, fervent heart, for the Lord searches all minds and discerns the design of every thought. If you seek God, if you seek God, if you seek God, God will be with you. If you forsake God, God will abandon you, and God has chosen you to build God's house, etc. And then it says in the next verse, remarkably, David gave his son Solomon the plan of the porch and its houses, its storerooms, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the ark cover, and the plan of all that had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, and all its surrounding chambers, all the treasuries, David gives Shlomo a blueprint for building the temple. In the book of Chronicles, the temple is a joint venture. The architectural drawings is David's. David has the whole thing worked out. He can't build it 
because God said you're not the one to build it because you're a soldier, but but your son will build it, the one that I have chosen, Shlomo. And David publicly makes the statement, publicly turns to Shlomo. He gives him his little talk about observing, observing God's rules, being with God and building God's house. So this is, there's more here, but this is the picture we have in the book of Chronicles. When you think about the book of Chronicles, it goes, it's completely different from what we read in Shmuel and the first chapters of Malachim, where there it's unclear who's going to be the king, where there it's all about manipulation, there it's about Absalom, who actually tries to kill his father, and Adonia in the first chapter, who proclaims himself his king as his sick father, his, his weak father, is trying to be warmed up by Avishag the Shunammite, not clear how much David knows or doesn't know, and his son parades around Jerusalem with his 50 men running in front of him. Here, there's no such story. There's no Absalom, never mentioned. There's no Adonia. There's no intervention. There's only one, one son who's going to succeed. And God makes it clear, this is the one that I have chosen. And there's something else interesting over here about the difference between the two stories. Because if you remember, thinking about the beginning of the Book of Kings, after Shlomo becomes the king, David gives Shlomo advice prior to David's death. And if you recall, and it's in your text in the second chapter, I believe it's the second chapter, or the end of the first, I think it's the second, what David says to Shlomo is, look, observe the commandments, obey God. That's the first part. And then David says, there are three things you got to take care of. The first is that Yoav, my former general, is a dangerous man who killed a couple of other people and I didn't know about it and didn't approve. And you're a smart fellow. You're a chacham. We'll get to that critical verse. You're wise. You know how to handle him and bring his head down to, to the grave in blood. That's the first thing, piece of practical advice that David gives Solomon. And the last thing David gives Solomon is, and there's his fellow Shimi, Shimi ben Gera, who when I was forced to flee Jerusalem, cursed me. And that's right there. You see it in front of you. He insulted me outrageously on the way to Machanayim. Do not let him go unpunished. You are a wise man. You're a chacham. You will know how to deal with him and send his gray hair down to Shaol in blood. And now that, that, my friends, are the last words that King David utters. His last words are, send his gray hair down to Shaol in blood. Bidam Shaol. Now, this is interesting in terms of the book of Malachim or the end of the book of Shmuel, which pulls no punches and has zero interest in apologizing for anyone or making them look any better than they are. Because had the writer of this intended to do so, the writer could have simply switched it around. Listen, son, kingship's a tough business, and sometimes you do things that are not the best. We have no choice. But above all, obey God, follow God's commandments, and David dies. But no, it's the other way around. His last words are, send his gray hair down to show in blood. And, you, and you're a wise man. You're a chacham. Ish chacham ata. In both Yoav case and the case of Shimi, David says to young Solomon, you're wise. You're a chacham. <clears throat> you know how to do it. What's the problem over here? The problem in this case is, says David, I swore to him, I will not put you to the sword. I took an oath not to kill him. So I couldn't kill him. But you're a smart guy, you're a wise man. You will know how to deal with him and bring his gray hair down to show in blood. Leaving out David's behavior, which is to put it mildly problematic, because what does it mean to say I swore not to kill him, but you should kill him? Isn't David in fact killing him? But my point is, that the entire picture over here and the words that David, the instruction that David gives to Shlomo in the book of Kings is a very down to earth and a sort of bloody instruction. It's all about eliminating your enemies. And this is completely absent in the book of Chronicles because there is no Absalom, there is no Adonai, or there is no Nathan who admonishes David. The Bathsheba story never happened, it's not written. And David's only instructing Shlomo about 
the temple and about obedience to God and they're building the temple together. It's a, it's a partnership of David and Shlomo. So the picture you get of Shlomo is radically different. And now I wanted to make one point here <clears throat> about, um, about the story in Kings as opposed to Chronicles. All this will set up our study and reading of different rabbinic texts. But let me make a simple point about Shlomo. If you think about King Solomon in the positive sense, and there is a very positive sense even in the book of Kings, we'll get to the negatives because our tradition hardly has interest in avoiding the negatives, to put it mildly. But Shlomo is the builder of the temple. Shlomo is the builder of the Beit HaMikdash. In the book of Chronicles, it's sort of a joint effort. David gives him the architectural drawings and the blueprints and all that. And David gives big donations to the temple. He's a big giver. He's a fundraiser. He gives his own gift. And uh, even in the book of Kings, it's a lot of chapters deal with Solomon's temple, the Beit HaMikdash, the permanent holy place, is Shlomo's place. And upon building it, he has a glorious prayer, a very long prayer that we will touch upon. So he's the builder of the temple. Now in the Bible, we have the temple. But we also have that which precedes the temple that we're reading now, about to read in the book of Exodus. And that's what's called the Mishkan. The Mishkan is also a temple, the first temple, but it's a portable temple. So who is the builder of the Mishkan? Who is the builder of the first temple? So we all know the builder of the first temple, his name is Betzalel. And what do we know about Betzalel? God says to Moshe, I've singled out Bitzawel, Karati Bishem, Bitzawel ben Uri ben Chur Mate Yehuda. He's the one who's going to build it from the tribe of Judah. For Oto Ruach Elohim. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. What does that mean, the Spirit of God? Bichachma Bitfuna Uvedat Uvacham Racha with Chachma Tavuna and Dat with wisdom, insight, Knowledge, Chachma, it's really Chachma, Bina, and Dat. It's Chabad, basically. That's where Chabad is there. Chachma, Bina, and Dat, these three attributes, and even the idea of the wisdom, the, the spirit of God, probably means the wisdom of God. So, in short, the temple is built by the, the Mishkan, the sanctuary, was built by someone, the main architect of the temple is filled with God's wisdom. In fact, when you think about how the Torah describes the work of B'tzalel, he's not just an architect, but his work is described as rachshov machshavot, to think thoughts. He's choshev machshavot. In fact, the Talmudic expression about work on the Sabbath that is forbidden, which is the work that was done in the Mishkan, is called mulechet machshavet thoughtful, thoughtful labor, purposeful labor, thoughtful labor. Now we know that what Solomon is known for and what Solomon prays for, actually, both in the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, when God says to Solomon in chapter three, tell me what you want. Young man, what do you want? And Solomon says very beautifully in chapter three, I want wisdom to be able to, to lead your people, to judge the people, to judge wisely. Give me wisdom to judge wisely. And God says to Solomon in chapter three, famously, you asked for the right thing. You're already pretty wise because you asked for the right thing. You didn't ask for the life of your enemy. You didn't ask for wealth. I'll give you those things as well. And if you behave yourself, I'll even give you longevity. You live, you have a long life, which Solomon apparently did not have, by the way. But that's what God said right here. And in other words, there is no one wiser than Solomon. The book of Kings makes this clear. He's so wise. He's the, he's the author of many proverbs and poems. And the whole world comes to hear of Solomon's wisdom, including the Queen of Sheba. Malkat Shiva, she comes and the whole world 
He's wiser than everyone else. He's wiser than all the wise men of Egypt and the famous wise men of the world. There is nobody as wise as Solomon. In short, one attribute for Solomon, if we have to pick one, the word is Chachma. Chachma. He's a Chacham. And the question is, actually, this attribute of wisdom, Lev Chacham V'Navon, that's the attribute that you actually need in the Torah to build the temple. So the Chachma, it's not just to judge the people, but the wise and discerning mind is the primary quality in the Chumash that is necessary to build God's temple. And here we have a very interesting idea, one which I believe lies behind many of the rabbinic statements about Shlomo and what the rabbinic texts wrestle with. It is true that Solomon is given this divine wisdom. It's a gift. No one ever is as, no one is as wise as Solomon. But in point of fact, we encounter Solomon's Chachma before you get to chapter three when God said, ask what you want. But we encounter Solomon's wisdom when David speaks to Solomon earlier. And David says to Solomon, David says to Solomon, you're a wise fellow. You'll figure out, you'll figure out what to do. You'll figure out a way to do it. How to get rid of Yoav. Because there's a problem getting rid of Yoav. See, Yoav was David's general. I would say David's essentially loyal general who saved David on more than one occasion. So David can't simply turn around and kill Yoav. But you're a wise man because Yoav's a dangerous man. He has his own, he thinks he has his own path. You're, you're a chacham, you'll figure it out. And then when it comes to David's last little speech, which is found only in Kings, Shimi ben Gera, terrible curse, you know, when I was fleeing Jerusalem and Absalom was out to get me and Shimi cursed me out and said, you, you wicked, bloody man, God is paying you back for your evil. You're a bloody man. And I swore not to kill him. And the reason David swore not to kill him is actually because Shimi was telling the truth. But he's a dangerous fellow. You're a chacham. You figure out how to get around the oath. So the point is, he's already a chacham. But the Chachma is used in the beginning of the book to kill. The Chachma is also the essential quality you need to build the temple. But we know that killing and temple are mutually exclusive. David himself says in Chronicles, I wanted to build the temple, but God said, you can't build the temple. You've shed too much blood. You're a warrior. You're a soldier. So the question, of course, that must be raised by the student of the Book of Kings, that's us, is what is the relationship between the Chachma, which is used to kill in the beginning of the book, and the Chachma that is used to build the temple uh, in the continuation of the book? Does one in fact undercut the other? That I think is an important question when you're studying Kings, and only the book of Kings, because in the book of Chronicles, this, this never happens. But in the book of Kings, it does happen. And this, I think, is what our tradition wrestles with in trying to figure out who is the Shlomo. I'll stop at this point. Uh, first of all, I don't have a watch here or anything. I have no idea what time it is. What time is it? Oh, 8.53, I see. Okay. Uh, if anybody has comments or questions at this point, and then we'll have to... Yes, Beth? Yeah, um, I'm really struck by uh, this idea of wisdom uh, and the association with... Um, you know, the bloody murderous reign. What's so interesting is that uh, King David is excluded from building the temple supposedly because according to him, because of all these battles. And yet he's got all the plans ready. He's got everything ready. He's got these balls, he's got the drawings, he's got the whole schmear all set to go. So not only does he have this violent past, but he also has this practical wisdom of how you would go about doing it. And then it passes on to his son and he starts out his reign with a violent act. And then here he goes ahead and he orchestrates the temple. Well, the first thing Shlomo actually does is that he kills his brother. 
In other words, before he, he does kill Yoav and he does kill Shimi, he doesn't do it himself. He has his hitman do it, Bidayal ben Yehoyada. But what's interesting is that he actually, the first person he kills is actually his own, his own brother who aspires to the throne for political reasons. I mean, Absalom killed Amnon on ethical grounds, I would say. But Shlomo kills Adonia on political grounds. It may be necessary or not. I would say two things. First of all, in the book of Shmuel, it's far from clear that the primary reason that David can't build the temple is because he's a killer. That's not the stated reason at all. Now, I, 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 I do think it's hinted at in the book, that's my stuff, but it's never stated as, as the reason. It's, there's a different reason given, but it doesn't matter. It is the reason David gives in the book of Chronicles. But yeah, I think that that's exactly my point, that my point about the Chachma is that it's being used in two radically different ways. And the question it raises, I think, is what is the relationship between them? You know, it's very interesting I saw something in the chat. I've taught the Book of Shmuel several times. Many years ago, I was very struck by the fact that at the beginning of the Book of, of Kings, where, where David's instructing his son whom to kill after his death how to, and all that, I was very struck, and people in the class at that point were very struck by the many parallels between the Book of Kings on one hand and the story in Godfather One on the other. There are many, many parallels, including what's very interesting. If you remember the Godfather, the Godfather warns him about who's going to get him, but he never mentions the fact that his son in law is also guilty. And the new Godfather, Michael, actually kills, he kills his brother in law. But the Godfather doesn't mention that. He doesn't he, to kill his, his daughter's husband. That's not. So David doesn't mention Adonia, actually. But Shlomo, <laughs> on his own, figures it out, you know? Father, father couldn't say it, but maybe father wouldn't disapprove either. So that's actually very interesting. And that's striking for a different reason that we'll get to, because killing your brother, which he does, is not the same as killing some outsider. Because killing your brother speaks to the core theme of the Book of Kings, which is the division of the nation. We'll touch upon these things later. One might say that in killing his brother before he actually fully assumes the kingship, and this is what the Midrash should pick up on actually, to what extent by the time Shlomo becomes king, is the kingship virtually doomed from the outset? That is a, that is a thread I think that we will encounter in the rabbinic text in the most interesting ways. What, what, let me just say as by way of introduction, what interests me uh, is not just what the rabbinic texts say, but I believe that the rabbinic texts in one form or another are trying to interpret the Bible. That's a belief I have about all the rabbinic texts. It doesn't mean they don't have a life of their own. You can study Bereshit Rabbah as a separate work. You can study Vayikra Rabbah as a separate work. Talmudic statements as a separate work. But I do maintain that they are, in addition, reading something off the text. I don't believe their whole course unrelated to the text. I believe they are, they are interpretive as well. So what always interests me, and in this class, I hope to try to demonstrate that, what did they pick up on in the text, in their portrayal of Solomon? And there are different portrayals of Solomon because there's obviously a very positive side to Solomon. He is the builder of the temple. He doesn't only build the temple. He actually defines what the temple is. Very interesting. So it's a very complex character. And yes, although Solomon doesn't occupy in our tradition the place of David, it's, David's on a different level as far as we're concerned. But Shlomo is very important and very interesting. And one thing we'll be looking at is how these rabbinic texts are reading the Bible. And I introduced all of this, uh, there'll be more introductions, but I introduced this by making a simple point. Here you have a character named Shlomo. And when you read the book of Chronicles, you get one impression. Pretend you never saw the book of Shmuel, you never saw the book of Kings. When you read the book of Chronicles, Shlomo is 
angelic. I mean, his whole time is spent on prayers, on temple. He, he's a man of peace. Uh, no wars in his lifetime. That's when you read the book of Chronicles, which is a very important book. It's a, it's a later work. One might say it's a precursor to the whole rabbinic tradition. And then you read Shmuel and you read Malachim. And then you get a radically different view of Shlomo. And what's interesting is where do, where do the rabbinic texts fit in? What are the, what are the, which texts of the Bible are the rabbinic texts latching onto in order to describe Shlomo or, or to teach us something about insight about Shlomo? Because what's interests us is not just Shlomo. What it, the character of Shlomo is very interesting. Because what the character of Shlomo, especially through the Bavli, not only the Bavli, what the rabbinic texts understood, and especially the Bavli, is that people are very complicated. It's not black and white. That people have pluses and minuses, and, and this is the important point, that sometimes the very negative is part of the positive. The very negative is part, the same man who has a thousand wives brings a thousand sacrifices. This is the deep insight of the, of the Bavli. So it's not, you know, it's easy, this one's, we like to carry this bad person, good person. There are some bad people out there, but most people are neither wholly bad nor wholly good. They're both. And very often it's the very same quality that's both. It's the very same quality that's both. It's the Moshe who's the great visionary and teacher who's very content with God on the top of the mountain, who's not very good with people on the bottom of the mountain. He's not a people person. That's not a slide on Moses. That's not who he is. That's not his mission. That's not his role. That's not his character. So therefore, every person has certain qualities. And the person that has no boundaries, that's negative. No boundaries is very dangerous in life, but also allows you sometimes without boundaries to have certain insights that other people will not have because you're not bounded at all. So that's, the, that's, the, that's, that's I think, one of the lessons we can take from the rabbinic texts so we will, this is by way of introduction, there may be more, we may do more introductions as we continue, but I just wanted to put out there in the very beginning that the very character of Shlomo in two books of the books of our canon, in Shmuel Mulachim on one hand and Divrei Hayamim on the other, we get very, very different pictures of this person, King Solomon, that we'll be studying largely through rabbinic text as we continue next week. If there are any questions, I'll take them now. Oh, if you have, can I ask a question? Yes, just one second. And if you have other questions, you can send me an email on dsober at and I'll be happy to try to respond. Yes. Uh, Dr. Svatman, yes. If, <laughs> you say uh, the, the negative um, quality is uh, really the positive quality. Often, my, yes. You know, like psychologists say that the reason you marry a, a man is the same reason you divorce him. So this is one, but I wanted to ask you, do you assume that the author of um, Ibrahim had in front of him the Melachim um, Buch, yes. or you think it, it comes from different circles and different perspectives? Well, that's an excellent question. I'll tell you what I believe very strongly, actually. I believe that, I believe this, I believe that we can demonstrate that the author of Chronicles sometimes is making changes in the book of Shmuel. It's clear that he has the book and he's making changes. I'll give you there are many examples. I'll give you one. There's a, a in one of the uh, descriptions of David's family, it says uh, that David's children, Kohanim Hayu, and David's sons were priests. Mm -hmm. In Divrei Hayam, it says, in the sons of David, would Rishonim Lamelech. Because the point is, the chronicler who makes a big deal about the priestly order and the way it's all set up, the idea of David's sons being priests is, a, is an anathema, it's a non-starter. So he doesn't want to think Kohen could be a minister, could be a priest, change the Rishonim Liyad HaMelech, which is a strange construction. It's clear that the author is changing it. And we have many examples of that. I do believe, and you hinted at this, that the book of Chronicles has other, has other texts. I, I believe there must have been Something like David, hundreds of stories of David before it's written down. And that some of them are very old and that 
even though the Book of Chronicles is a much later book, it doesn't mean that the stories in the Book of Chronicles are later. It could be that they're even earlier, but the, the Book of the Chronicle for his own purposes, because he wants to focus on the temple basically, and on the return and all that, and he talk, focuses on those who built the temple. So he's choosing his stories, I believe, and they're, they're some stories that don't appear at all in Shmuel or Malachim, and they may be older stories. It is possible he just makes them up, but I think more likely is he's drawing on certain traditions. He may tell them his own way, but it's also clear to me that sometimes he simply changes the text. That's clear to me. I, 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 I once, I'm not going to keep writing it all down, but I can probably, if I had to come up with 10 examples where it's clear that he is simply changing the language of the Book of Shmuel. That's, that's clear to me. But on the other hand, I do, I'll give you one last example of a very interesting one. And that is that in the Book of Shmuel, you have a list of David's strongmen, the Giborim of David, which is 2 Samuel chapter 23, next to last chapter. You have a similar list of, of strongmen of Giborim in Book of Chronicles, virtually the same list with small differences. But what's interesting is the order. In the Book of Chronicles, amongst the Giborim is Uriah the, the Chitim, Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba. He's mentioned towards the end. He's not in the book of Samuel, it's the last name on the list, leading into David's sin. So it's clear to me, I think, I would argue that Uriah the Hittite was probably not last on the list. And that the list in Chronicles is older and that the Samuel author changes the list because he wants to make that Uriah the Chiti, the last verse before you get to the, God's anger against David and Israel. So that's an example where I would say that the list in Chronicles, book written hundreds of years afterwards, is actually earlier. And I think that's true of many of the stories. That's my opinion. I can't prove it, but I think it's, uh, I, I believe it's right, actually. But you don't argue that, uh, like Sifut Chazal, you don't think that this is an interpretation of uh, Melachim, because you say- No, I think it's a change, actually. I think very often it's a change. I think uh -huh. that- so I in this sense, it's different. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's different, but I think sometimes the Book of Chronicles doesn't like that interpretation. I mean, Kohanim doesn't have to be a priest, but they don't want any ambiguity. So I'll stop at this point. And if anybody has questions, desoberatrisha.org. Looking forward to continuing. Some of the texts, by the way, that we'll encounter are remarkable. I've got to tell you, this came across one this week, and truly remarkable. But we'll, we will get to that in the coming weeks. Anyway, thank you once again. Looking forward. Thank you, Abba Silva. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, before everyone logs off, uh, you're welcome to go if you need to, but I'd like to extend a thank you, of course, to Rabbi Silver for a wonderful, wonderful class. I'm sure we're all intrigued uh, about the big questions and details we'll be exploring in coming weeks. And also to thank everyone else who joined us today on Zoom, Drisha Live, and Facebook. We are going to continue with our spring programming tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern with the start of a fascinating class entitled Rabbinic Authority and Personal Autonomy in Early Rabbinic Law, Three Case Studies, given by Dr. Ayelet Hoffman Lipson. You can find out more information and register for that class, as well as all of our other spring programming on our website at www.drisha.org slash classes. Thank you again to Rabbi Silver for this wonderful opportunity to learn with you. And for everyone else who attended, we hope to see you again soon and brush up on your godfather knowledge before next week, if necessary. <laughs>